Shalom. All right. What does Trinity mean? And is it biblical? Will we find the teaching of Trinity in Scripture? All right. Well, first, let's look up what does it mean. Okay. And the definition says a Christian Godhead as one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Basically, it's saying that there's one God, but he um, splits himself up in three, right? That's what the definition of Trinity means. It says, and God is says to be Trinity in unity. Okay, that's what it says. All right. But does the scripture teach this? Does the scripture teach this? Okay. Right, let's see. It says, What does Trinity mean? Let's click on this. The unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three persons and as in one God has according to Christian dogma. Okay. Um okay, let's go to scripture. Let's see if the word Trinity is there. And yeah, not found. Okay, so the word Trinity is not there, but a lot will say that believes this will say, well, the word Trinity is not there, but the concept and the teaching is there. They'll say that, but um, that's a lie. That is um, indoctrination. They've been indoctrinated a lot of them, and a lot of them well, who have been taught it was, it, it is not true. They still hold on to it because um, they do not want to let go of their traditions or whatever the case may be. Yeah, um, Trinity teaching is not scripture. And as we go through these scriptures, um, Father's willing, your eyes will be open and you will see that this is a lie and you need to let it go. All right. In, in Jesus name. All right. Let's get into it. All right. Um. First scripture I like to go to is Second Peter chapter one, starting at verse one, and it says, "Nor first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation." What does this mean? It says that no one should have their own interpretation of scripture, and that includes no group of people should have their own interpretation of scripture so what this scripture is saying what this verse is saying that what the bible says matter and not what man says okay let's read it again it says knowing this first that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation verse 21 for the prophecy came in old times by the will of man it says for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It says, it's saying that no man didn't just come together and say, well, this is what we're going to say the scripture says. But it says they was moved by the Holy Ghost. This is why we see scriptures from Ezekiel, from Daniel from Isaiah from all from Jeremiah from all these prophets who was who some was hundred years apart and their word that they wrote down their word of God match up perfectly because it wasn't by their will but it was the Holy Spirit that was in them this is why the word lined up so perfectly so no one can come and tell you something that doesn't line up with scripture and say this is the word of God. It has to line up. So if it doesn't line up, which the Trinity doesn't, is not the word of God. Okay. All right. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter six. Deuteronomy chapter six. Verse four, and it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay. 
So many will go to this scripture and says, okay, there's one God, which I definitely agree with. There's one God that's the source of everything. You know, there's one God that everything else can come from. Right. And this is one of the scriptures that stumbling block for people that believe in the Trinity as well, too, because of this verse. They'll say, well, we know there's one God. So Jesus must be that one God and and the Holy Spirit is three in one, you know, or whatever the case may be. However, they sum it up in their mind. Um, and we know that we already know of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, they form the doctrine or whatever that three person is one, which are a lot of Jews disagree with. A lot of Israelites disagree with and on. And I agree with these Israelites as well as these Jews, because if you really understand scripture, their beliefs are, are not biblical at all. However, it, it, there are some Israelites that believe in the Trinity, whether they, they believe it or not. They do believe in the Trinity or are confused by the teachings and still hold on to some of the doctrines. As we go on, we'll. We'll see and uh, expose some of these these lies. OK. Even though we know that the scripture says that there is one God. However, the scripture does speak of other gods. And what do I mean? Anybody that have read in the Hebrew knows that. Angels are even called Elohim. And you don't even have to speak Hebrew. It's written plainly in the English. It calls angels gods. We'll get into that. Even regular men are called gods, according to scripture. And, of course, everybody knows idols are called gods as well. But we must read in context to know who is this talking about. OK. So let's go to first Peter. Chapter one, verse three, and it says, blessed be the God and the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first Peter one, three just says. Jesus has a God. I didn't say it. This is what it basically says. It says, blessed be the God. And the Father, and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So now we have to put scripture together and see, does other scripture line up with what Peter just said? And do Christ agree with what Peter just said? Because Peter just said, Jesus has a God. Right? Okay. So let's go to John. John chapter 20. And verse 20, 27. Then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger. Uh, now, hold on. Let me stop and bring up the background. Um, okay. This is after Christ resurrected. And of course, Thomas was doubting. And this is when um, Jesus is proving to Thomas that he did indeed resurrect. Okay. All right. Verse 27, it says, Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and trust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believe. And, of course, Thomas felt um, Christ's womb, and here's what he said in verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So he just called Jesus God. A lot will say, well, isn't this a contradiction? Well, we know, and all of us who believe scripture, there is no contradiction. But anytime we see that is maybe some under misunderstanding on our part. All right. So what we have to do is look at all the scriptures, put all the scriptures together and let the scriptures paint a picture for us. All right. So. We read in Peter where it says Jesus has a God, but here 
we see Thomas is calling Jesus God. So how can that be so? Some would say, isn't this a contradiction? We know a lot of atheists will say that and um, people who don't understand will say that, okay, this must be a contradiction. But let's see what, what Jesus says. Let's go up to verse 17. Okay. And this is the same setting. It's after the resurrection, right? Jesus said unto her, touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father. He's saying he's going to heaven to his father and to your father. He's saying my heavenly. This is what he's saying. He's saying my heavenly father is your heavenly father. Okay. And to my God. So Jesus just said, he has a God. And he said, and to your God. Jesus just said, I am ascending unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. I'm going to read it once again. And I'm going to explain it once again. Jesus is saying to her that I didn't go to heaven yet to my father, talking about his heavenly father, which is your heavenly father. And he said, I didn't go to heaven yet into my God. Jesus just said he had a God who is the same God as your God. This verse exposed the Trinity. This verse and several verses. Jesus said he has a God. He did not say he is the God. Speaking of God the Father. The source of everything. Let's read it one more time. He said, I ascend unto my father and your father, to my God and your God. So Christ just said he has a God. Let's see if there's more scripture that supports this. We already know. First Peter 1 and 3 supports this. Peter just said, Peter said, Christ has a God. And Christ just said, yes, I have a God, which is the same God as your God. Okay? So, let's go to John chapter 10, where the Mashiach, the Messiah, reinforced this. John chapter 10. And we'll start at verse 31. Oh, and don't worry, I will go to verse 30, but let's just start at verse 31. And it says, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So the Jews took up stones to stone Christ. Why? Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? He's saying, look, man, I did a lot of good works. We all know his good work. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He healed the blind. He fed many out of basically nothing. Okay. So he's saying, look, man, I did all these good works. You going to stone me from the good works? Which one? And look at how the Jews answer him. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work, we stone you not. They said, none of, for none of those good works you did, we stoning you. But this is why we stoning you. But for blasphemy, because that thou being a man, make it thyself God. So the Jews said, you said you are God. So the Jews basically took it as Jesus was saying he is God. And that's why they want to stone him. Okay. They took as Jesus is saying God, just like a lot of people, like a lot of people that believe in the Trinity, saying Jesus is saying he's God. In verse 30, Jesus said, I and my father are one. So because Jesus said, I and the father are one, they took up stones and was ready to stone him. Right? A lot of Trini people that believe in the Trinity will go to this verse and say, Jesus is saying he is God. But if they read everything else, 
after this verse in context, they will see that Jesus did not say this. Hold on one second. Okay, the noise stopped, and now I can finish going. Okay, so, so if we keep going through this, we'll see that Jesus did not actually say that he is God the Father, right? Okay, so let's go back to it. Okay, then the Jews took up stone again to stone him. Jesus answered, many good works have I showed you from my father, which of these works do you stone me, right? And verse 33, the Jews answered, saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but blasphemy, and because thou being a man, makest thyself God. Verse 34, here's Jesus' reply to that, because they accused Jesus of saying he is God the Father, right? Jesus said, answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God. He said, hold on. He said, the Old Testament says you are gods. So, how are you going to stone me? If the Old Testament said you are being a regular man, you are gods. Now, let's look at the context of what we're reading. Who is Jesus speaking to? He's speaking to Jews, right? Right? Don't let anybody try to put their own interpretation of this. Let's stick to the context. Jesus is speaking to Jews that accuse him of saying he's God, right? Jesus replies saying, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said you are God? He said the law said you are God. Let's go into some of these scriptures. Let's pause for John chapter 10 real quick. And let's go to some of these scriptures in the Old Testament that says these Jews and Israelites are gods. All right. Let's start with Psalms. Let's start with Psalms 138. 138 verse 1. It says, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. Now, this is a psalm of David, and he's saying he will praise the Most High God in front of the gods. Who is he speaking to about when he said in front of the gods? Why is David speaking like this? Gods don't exist, right? Why is David speaking like this? He's speaking of regular Israelite men like himself. Because he knows. You may not know. You may not understand. Your pastor may not have taught you. But he knows. David knows. That other men are called gods. They're not the most high God. We are not to worship them. As our heavenly father. But they're also called gods as well. Right? That's what he said. He said I will praise thee. Before the gods will I sing. Praise unto thee. Let's go to more verses. Okay, let's go to Psalm. Let's stay in Psalms. Okay, but let's go to Psalms 97. Verse 7. And look what it says. Confounded be all they that serve graven images. Okay, confused. It's saying confused are all these people that worship graven images, right? That boast themselves in idols. Worship him, all you gods. Hmm. David just said it again. David just called regular men gods. Just like Christ said. Not my word, but Christ, right? And the scriptures. Let's break down the context. And it says, confound be all they that serve graven images. It says, confused are all they that serve graven images. That boast themselves in idols. Says, who is he talking about? People 
that worship graven images. And he said, worship him. Who is him? He's talking about the Most High God. All you gods who serve graven images, men. He's speaking to them and he's calling them gods. He's saying you need to worship him. And he called them gods because you you are the son of God, the sons of God. God made you in his image. So if God made you in his image, you are, in a sense, a lower God. Whether you want to accept it, get mad or not. You're not the most high God, but you're a lower God who doesn't have power like the most high God, period. And this is what David's saying, not my words. The scripture says, all right, let's go to Psalms 82. Psalms 82. And it says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judged among the gods. Now, this one is speaking about the angels. He says, it says, God stand in the congregation of the mighty and he judge amongst the gods. Speaking about the angels. OK. And how do we know? Well, read the whole chapter in context. Let's skip to verse. Let's skip to verse six. It says. I have said you are gods, and all you are the children of the Most High. But you shall die like men. Hold on one second. Let's pause. And it says, I have said you are gods, and all you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Now, let's focus on verse 6. We know that regular mortal men can die, but we know angels cannot die. The only person that can kill or take the life of an angel is the Most High God who created them, right? Right? So this is who he's, we know who he's talking about because he said they will die like men. Speaking about the angels. It says, I have said you are God, speaking about the angels, and all you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men. So speaking of the angels, and I know some will disagree. That's your choice, but this is who he's speaking of, okay? But anyway, whether you want to believe this is talking about angels or men, whatever you want to believe, the scriptures do indeed speak of angels as being called gods, period. You know, they're called Elohims in several verses, all right? But anyway, let's go back to John chapter 10. Let's go back to John chapter 10, okay? And let's go to verse 38. Okay. Um, you know what? Hmm, maybe we'll go back. Just so we we already went through the scriptures where um we already went back to the scriptures and Psalms where David and the Psalms were speaking of men as gods, right? So look what Jesus says, right? He says Verse 34, and he says, Jesus answered them, Is it not written that in the law I said you are gods? And we went through the scriptures, and it did indeed call men gods, right? So verse 35, and he says, If he called them God, speaking of God, the most high God, right? He's saying, Unto who the word of God came, who the word of God came to? He gave the word of God to the Israelites, the Jews, right? And the scriptures cannot be broken. The scriptures we know indeed cannot be broken. The scriptures is true, right? Verse 36, look what it says. Say you of him who the father has sanctified and sent into the world, 
thou blasphemy because I said I am the son of God? He's saying, so basically, the word of God call you, who is Christ speaking to? Christ is speaking to Jews. He's saying, the word of God call you gods. And you're saying I blaspheme because I said I am the son of God? Focus on verse 36. Jesus said he's the son of God, not God the heavenly father. And how do you know this? He compared it with the Jews. He said, the scripture says you are gods. How are you going to stone me? Because I said, I'm the son of God. How are you going to stone me? If I said, I'm the son of God. Because you are sons of God too. Now, they're not the begotten son of God. He is the only begotten. Right? Like the begotten. He's the only begotten, right? But there are also sons of God. So how are you going to stone him? He didn't commit blasphemy. He didn't say he would. He would have commit blasphemy if he would say he was the heavenly father. He would have broke the first commandments, which is putting himself above God. You should not have. The first commandment is you should not have no other gods before the heavenly father. If he would have said that, if Christ would have said that, he would have broke that commandment. Just like people who believe the Trinity, whether they believe it or not. Them saying that Christ is the heavenly father and they're all the same person. They're breaking that first commandment, whether they believe it or not. All right, let's keep going. If I do the works of my father, believe me not, but I do. You believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the father is in me and I in him. Now, these people in the tr who believe the Trinity, they'll run with this thing. Oh, he said that. Hold on one second. There's a lot of noise, so I'm going to have to pause for a second. So once again, verse 38, people that believe in the Trinity, they'll run with this and say, he said he's in the Father and the Father is him. They're three in one. <laughs> they'll run with this and say it, but they'll ignore other scriptures that contradict this. The scriptures cannot contradict each other. They cannot. All right. So let's see how foolish your belief is if you believe in the Trinity. Let's see how foolish it is. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, okay? And we know this is when the apostles, disciples, got the Holy Spirit. It says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them others. Okay, so we know all of them is filled with the Holy Ghost, you know, the power of God. They got the power of God and they was able to do miraculous things because they was... The Holy Spirit is in them now, right? If they went around saying, you know, the Holy Spirit is in them, right? The Holy Spirit is in them, right? Would anybody take it as um, they are the Holy Spirit? No one would do that. No one would do that. Because they wasn't indoctrinated to, to think that. And you can clearly see this person is. This person can bleed and do all these things. You clearly know that this person is not the Holy Spirit. You'll, you'll understand what they're saying is. Basically, they're saying the power of God is in them. That's what you'll take them when they say the Holy Spirit is in them. But. Some people say, well, this is Jesus. He said the father is in me, so he must be the father. That's not what he's saying. He's basically saying it within the same context as what I'm saying is, if he's saying the father is in me, he's basically saying the father's power is in him or he's doing the will of the father. If a regular man walks around and says, God is in me, you won't take it as he's saying, He's the heavenly father. You'll take it as in he's 
um, believes in God and God powers in him or um, he's doing the will of God. That's what you'll take it as. But somehow when you read that text, you've been trained, you've been indoctrinated to believe that Christ is saying that he's the heavenly father. Let's go into other scriptures and see what I'm what I'm saying and what we are reading is indeed true that that verse John chapter 10 verse 38 is not saying he's the heavenly father. Let's go to other scriptures. All right. Let's go to Mark. Let's see how stupid this is and ridiculous this is. And don't get offended, I'm not calling you stupid, but I'm calling the belief is is stupid. This teaching is stupid, okay? Mark chapter 10. Okay, let's go to verse 6. Let's start at verse 6. Because this is concept is in the Bible, and no one would believe it, you know? Believe um, this teaching when it's compared to other things, all right? Mark chapter 10, verse 6. It says, but from the beginning, talking about marriage, from the beginning of the creation God made the male and female. For this cause shall, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Verse 8. And that twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. Okay? So we know this is saying a husband and wife shall be one. No one is stupid enough to say that when this scripture is saying husband and wife are one, that they are the same person now since they got married. No one would say that. No one would say that. But when Christ says the father's in me, they say, oh, they must be one person. They must be the same person. Come on, stop, stop this. This is a lie. No one would say that when it compares to a married person when scripture clearly said they became one flesh. No one would say that. But they've been indoctrinated to believe when Christ says this. They are saying he's saying is one. When he clearly says that, the scripture says, mortal men are gods. So how are you going to stone me because I said I'm the son of God? He clearly explained it to you. That right then and there, that was Christ's opportunity. If the Trinity is true, that was Christ's opportunity to say, yep, I am God. And they could have stoned him or whatever could have happened right then and there. But he did not say that. He corrected them and said, the scripture said you are God. I said, I'm the son of God. He didn't say, yes, indeed, I am God. So go ahead and stone me. He did not say that. He did not say that. So stop believing these lies. Maybe your pastor's making a mistake. Your pastor could indeed be making a mistake. Your pastor could be indoctrinated just like you have been indoctrinated. And maybe you bring this truth to him. Some of them will not accept it because they don't want to let go of their tradition. But it doesn't line up with scripture. Period. It doesn't. It doesn't. Okay. So let's go to John chapter 10, verse 30. John chapter 10. Verse 30. And it says, I and my father are one. Okay. We just read where it says husband and wife are one. Well, we know they're not one. So does this scripture mean that Christ and the Father are one? Are they they're the same person? No, it just means they agree. They have one common goal. That's what he means. And he wants us to have one common goal, just like him and the Father. He wants us to be in unity. Just like a football team, basketball team should be one and have one goal to win a championship, to win a game. That's what he's talking about. 
Let's prove it. Okay. He says, John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and the father are one. So let's prove the belief of the Trinity when they use this verse and says that Christ must be the heavenly father. Let's prove that they are dead wrong. Okay. Let's go to John chapter 17, verse 22. Okay. And look what it says. It says, and the glory which thou give me, I have given them that they may be one. Even as we are one. Christ just says he want his followers. His followers. To be one. Just like him and the father are one. Hmm. So, if I'm a disciple of Christ, which I am, and all of us who, who believe and do the works of, of, of Christ and the Father, can we go around saying we are the Heavenly Father? We wouldn't do such a thing because we know it's wrong. So how can we say that Christ is saying he's the Heavenly Father? When he said he want us to be one, just like him and the father. That exposed the Trinity. It's a lie. Let it go. Let it go. It's a lie. All right, let's go. Let's go up. Let's make sure it says. Need to pray no, um, to verse 21. Let's go with 21. It says that they all may be one as the father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me christ speaking of his disciples right verse 22 and the glory which thou give me the glory that god gave christ saying he gave him i have given them that they may be one even as we are one I in them and thou in me, verse 23, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and I love them as thou hast loved me. Drop the mic right there. Trinity got exposed. Let go of that false teaching. But anyway, Let's keep going. Christ just said that he want us, his followers, to be one. Just like him and father, the father are one. Who is the father? The same father he called his God that we just read in John chapter 20, verse 17. The same God that Peter, Peter said. Who is Jesus God? Hmm. All right. So. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. Let's go to Acts chapter 7. This is all over scripture. So why do people believe in the Trinity? Because they have been indoctrinated. They do not want to let go of traditions. They've been grew up since a probably a toddler and being being just bombarded with, oh yeah, they're, they're three and one. And, and this lie, that's not even scripture. It's not even biblical. Okay? Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And we'll start at verse 55. This is when Stephen, or Stephen, or however you pronounce it, is about to go into heaven. Alright? John chapter... 55. Look what it says. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up set fast in heaven and he saw the glory of God. So Stephen seeing the glory of God, right? And then he says, and then it says, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He's looking into heaven where well, we know Jesus ascended into heaven already. 
And what did Jesus say? Jesus said he ascended to his father. And look, Stephen, right, is looking into heaven. Who does he see? He see two people. He see God the Father, and he see Jesus at the right hand. If Jesus and God is the same person, why when he looked in heaven, he didn't see one? But he saw two. He saw God the Father, and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand. Verse 56. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open up, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He said it again in verse 56. Okay, he saw Jesus, the Messiah, standing on the right hand of God. Let's see if there's other scriptures that back this up. Okay? Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Verse 34. And it says. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God. Did this verse just say Christ is the Heavenly Father? Or does it say he's next to the Heavenly Father on his right hand? It says he's on, at the right hand. So let go of this false teaching that he is the Father. When he, he himself says he has a God. Okay? Let's go to Colossians 3. Colossians 3. One. If you, if ye then being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sit on the right hand of God. Where it says he sit? It says sit at the right hand of God. Next to God. Next to God. He's a second in command after God. That's what that means. Right hand of God. He's the second in command. He intercedes for us. That's why we pray. We end our prayers in Jesus' name. Because he's, he's our mediator. He's our lawyer. When we're praying and we end our prayer in Jesus' name, we're not saying that um, Jesus is the most high God. How some people may interpret it. And some people who are against that. He's interceding for us. Didn't the Israelites say to Moses, go ahead and speak to God on our behalf because they were so afraid of God? God didn't say, no, you are wrong. I'm going to speak to all of y'all. No, he allowed that. He allowed Moses to be the Israelite mediator. That's why Christ is the prophet like unto Moses. And he is our mediator. He is our mediator. And. He speaks to God on our behalf. Okay. All right. So let's go to Daniel. Let's see something back this up. Let's go to some Old Testament scripture. A Old Testament scripture. And see. If it backs up what we just went through. Okay. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 13. And look what it says. And I saw in a night vision. And behold one like the son of man. Come with the clouds of heaven. And came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near unto him. All right. Now we know. Acts chapter 1. Speaking of Christ going into heaven. In the clouds. So right here, Daniel chapter 7, it says, I saw in a night vision, behold, one like the son of man come with the clouds. So this verse in Daniel saying, son of man went to heaven in the clouds and went to the ancient of days. Who is the ancient of days? Is the most high God, our heavenly father. Jesus is God. Saying he went, the son of man, who is Christ, who is the Messiah, went to heaven on a cloud 
and went to the Ancient of Days. Who is the Ancient of Days? The Most High God. He said, I saw a night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near unto him. And what did they give him? Verse 14. And they were giving him dominion. So they gave him power and glory and the kingdom that all people, nations and language so serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that is that which shall not be destroyed. Saying God gave him power. This is what Daniel just said. God gave the Mashiach the son of man, power. So this verse in Daniel agrees with God being at the right hand. I mean, that Christ is being at the right hand of God. This verse agree that the son of man, who is the Messiah, who is Christ, is at the right hand of God. Okay? All right, so let's go to Revelation, which also agree with this. Let's go to Revelation. Let's go to chapter five. And it says, and I saw and I saw in the right hand of him that sit on the throne, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. It says, OK, so it says. He saw a book at him that sit on the throne talking about the most high God and it was sealed with seven seals right let's read it again I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within it and on the backside sealed with seven seals verse 2 and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is ready to open the book and to loose the seal thereof okay so that God the heavenly father right he has a book in his hand. So that's what we're picturing. We're, we're picturing what we're reading. He have a book in his hand. And the angel saying, who? Who is worthy to open this book? Right? Who is worthy? Verse 3. No man in heaven, right? Nor on earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book. It says no one was worthy. So he looking. He said nobody was worthy, right? Needed to look upon it. So nobody was even worthy to look at the book, right? Verse 4. And I rep much. So we know um the the John who's who's having this vision. He 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 said he crying because man, nobody was worthy to open that book. But we know we all have sin, right? Fall the glory, fall short of the glory of God, right? Because no man was found ready to open a book. So it says John was crying because nobody was ready to open a book, right? And not even ready to look on it, right? Or to read the book, neither to look upon it. Verse 5. And one of the elders sitting on said unto him, so we know elders sit next to um the most high God, right? But that's for another teaching for those that don't know. All right. And one of the elders said unto him, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah. Who is the line of the tribe of Judah? The Messiah, Christ. The root of David, the, who's the offering of David? Christ. Has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seal there. Okay. So verse five, let's focus. It says, the elder said, man, stop crying. One is worthy. Because he did something. There's one is hope worthy. He said he had prevailed. What did he do? He said, it said he prevailed. He overcame. Right? It says, the one of the elders said unto him, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, we know is the Messiah, title for the Messiah, the root of David has prevailed to open the book. He said, look, he overcame to open the book and to loose the seven seal thereof. He said, look, the elder said, he prevailed. He overcame to open the book. Verse 6. And behold, lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. Who is this lamb who has been slain? We know 
Christ is called the Lamb of God. He has been slain and he was resurrected, right? So we know who we're talking about, talking about Christ. It says, stood a lamb as it has been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into the earth. Verse seven, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So it says the lamb, right? It says the lamb of God, right? It says the, the seed of David, right? Right? It says the line of the tribe of Judah, right? We all know these are titles of, of Christ, right? It says, came and took the book out of him that sat on the throne, out of his father's hand, right? And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vows full of odor, which are the prayers of the saints. So it says, the only one that was worthy is the line of the tribe of Judah. He was worthy. The offspring of David. He was worthy. The line that was slain. He was worthy. Who was that? Christ. He's saying he came and got the book from him. From the, He was the only one that was worthy. This sounds like the same scene we just read in Daniel. Where he was the Messiah, the son of the son of man was brought to the ancient of days with a cloud and got all power and dominion. It sounds like the same thing right here. So we know. We know who is this talking about? It's talking about the Messiah. So Revelation agrees with the book of Daniel. Christ had to get power from his father. If he's the most high God, why is he getting power from God, his father? Because he's not the most high God. This is why. We know there's even scripture that says Christ said himself, his father is greater than him. Christ said, his father is greater than him. We know that scripture that even says that Christ don't know certain things. It says, he says, no man knows the hour, but only his father in heaven. So let's let go of that false teaching. Of this trinity. That Christ is the heavenly father. Because that's breaking the first commandment. Okay. Exodus. Chapter 20. Verse 3. And it says. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We just went in several scriptures. That called. Men God. Called angels gods. We even seen in scripture. We already know. Idols are called gods. You know, there's even scripture that implies money is God. We can't put any of those things before the most high God, not even the Mashiach. So let's let go of this false teaching of the Trinity and believe the word of God.